Okay, we should be live. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Stellar Podcast. We're live again, as we are every single month. Uh, this time, we're joined by a special guest, though. We're joined by Justin Rice, SCF's head of ecosystem, aka the guy who gets to tell me and Tyler what to do so we don't go off the rails. Um, but yeah, Justin, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit, and then we'll kind of dive into the rest of it. Uh, well, that was pretty much it. Colton covered it. I'm Justin, head of ecosystem at SDF, and very excited to be here. Um, fan of the podcast, and I hope so. Um, no, no, I think <laughs> <laughs> I've been here for a while, um, like maybe a year and a half or a year, somewhere in between there. And you know, I'm I'm very excited about Stellar and about SDF and about all the new stuff that we're doing and making and all the changes that are happening in the ecosystem and excited to talk about it today. Yeah, for sure. I and guess. You, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. What, what, let me preface this with, this is our first time doing this and this is our first time doing a, a three person interview. So me and Tyler are probably going to interrupt each other the entire time. So that's just how it's going to go. It's highly likely. <laughs> that's just how it's going to go. But yeah, go ahead, Tyler. When you first started at uh, the ecosystem, like how, there were, it was just you, right? Just you, all your lonesome and the ecosystem team. And uh, and you've grown that team. We have we have several folks now. So yeah, now it's a total of five people. When it started out, uh, yeah, it started out with just me. It was I was actually hired to write and develop content and to help on the product team. A lot of what we were working on then was the was the revamp of Stellar.org. And so when I came in, it was a lot of like learning about Stellar, thinking about Stellar, writing about Stellar. Um, but over the course of that I also started to talk a lot to people in the ecosystem and there was a need uh, on sort of the org chart it was this idea that we needed to have a team that was dedicated to communicating with the ecosystem and so by the time that I'd spent some a lot of time writing content and helping put stellar.org together and talking to people in the ecosystem it was like a pretty natural fit um, for me to transition into that role and when it started it was just me uh, and over the past over really this year it's, it's grown a lot um, as has SDF generally. Yeah, I, I think that's maybe we're touching on a little bit because as somebody who is outside of um, SDF itself in the in the ecosystem building applications and things, um, I had the sense that SDF was this very large, well-oiled machine organization with lots of individuals and it really wasn't that. And it's really only recently started um, hiring a lot of folks and developing these internal teams. So maybe talk a little bit about the the history and trajectory of SDF from going to just a few engineers to where we are now and where we're headed, talking about it, some of the different um, roles and teams within uh, the SDF and, and ultimately where the ecosystem uh, fits in those teams. Sure, uh, I think uh, not long ago, really SDF had a great mission and a great technology. Uh, I think that Stellar Core and Horizon the Stellar API were working great and people were starting to, to sort of show interest in the network. But the organization itself, the Stellar Development Foundation was, was understaffed. And so growing that organization was one of the key objectives to actually make it so that it could fulfill its mission, not only of like trying to get people to use Stellar and trying to make it easy to use Stellar, but to do that in order to like create equitable access to the world's financial infrastructure. Um, in the beginning, you know, it was very much, uh, people were not so specialized in what they did. There was just like a lot to do. And you would sort of find challenges that you could take on um, and try to, to make sure that things didn't fall apart. Uh, however, one of the key goals, which was to find more people that started to ramp up, started hiring, hiring, hiring. And as that hiring happened, the organization also started to like sort of um, distill into more specific teams. And so now this is probably no surprise, but SDF has a team structure teams are you know there's a lot of engineering teams there's a horizon team a stellar core team a nebula team that works on other engineering projects an integration team a business development team marketing a product team um ecosystem is one of those teams and it's kind of fits in somewhere in the middle i mean on the one hand we we touch almost all of those departments we talk to the people on the engineering side we talk to the people on the marketing side we talk to the people on the business development side and we sort of help uh uh, help them understand what's going on outside in the ecosystem. So in a way we like sort of sit Janus like at the entryway, um, looking partially into SDF, partially out to the ecosystem. What's going on? What can we do better? 
And then we attempt to basically create resources, and tools, and communication, and uh, basically like channels for communication that make it easy for people to understand how and why and what's built on Stellar. And then we also, you know, Stellar is a, a decentralized, permissionless, come, you know, self-serve network. Um, but there's still a lot of coordination that needs to happen. Like we need to know who's building on the ecosystem in order to effectively understand how to evolve the technology that we work on um, in order to coord help coordinate projects that are disparate um, so that they can learn about each other and start to work together. Uh, and in order to coordinate um, big changes to the network. Um, so when there's a network upgrade, for instance, or when we're trying to get validators to collaborate together, it helps to have a team that understands sort of how to help them work together. And that's kind of the ecosystem team. So helping the ecosystem work together, helping SDF understand what the ecosystem is doing, and then also generating material content products that help people build on Stellar and help make it self-serve. Yeah, and I guess like circling back a little bit, what, I guess what, it, what it, based on your previous uh previous positions in your throughout your entire career like what about ecosystem or like growing an ecosystem is specifically interesting to you like i think uh people know what's interesting about about it for like me and tyler but they haven't heard from you much so what is what is your interest in like growing an ecosystem and how is like especially working at sdf kind of shaped that right well i like cats okay and uh <laughs> and so i like herding cats right it's like, Agreed. how do you get a lot of people with different objectives to align and work together and interoperate? That's an interesting challenge to me. Um, how, how do you do it? In, you're basically a, a helper, a supporter, an advisor. You're not in control of them. You're basically trying to find a re help people find a reasonable path forward together, even though they're all different people. That's what it's, it's just like a really interesting set of challenges. But also, I would say, like, Stellar is not a consumer-facing technology, right? We build this amazing backend that people can use to make payments and trades and sort of hold and, and transfer currencies. Um, but really, the, the success or failure of, of the network depends on the growth of the ecosystem. Our goal, in a lot of ways, is to make it so that products and services build on Stellar. So on the one hand, it's an interesting set of challenges, and on the other hand, I think it is sort of core to the mission of SDF, which I really believe in. Um, it's good to be helping like sort of grow the, 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 the thing that is vital to, to the success of, of Stellar and the SDS objectives, and also to just improving the world. Yeah, it's like, it's an interesting set of challenges because there's, there's no like one right answer. And we talk about this a lot, how there's like, there's no one way to do things. And if you even look at the most robust open source ecosystems, like the Python ecosystem, for example, uh, it took a decade for people to transfer from like Python 2 to Python 3. And so being able to look at problems like that and be like, okay, well, how can we come up with solutions so that whenever we're trying to push a network upgrade or something like protocol 13, where how do we make sure everybody's on board? How do we make sure that people are prepared? How do we know that this is an upgrade they're gonna like, et cetera? And I guess, uh, moving into another question, like what have been, uh, I guess over the course of, let's say the last year when our team has really started to take shape, like what are some of the problems that we, you think we saw in the ecosystem that we've done a good job of sort of addressing so far? Uh, I think that we've done a better job of, of communicating with the ecosystem. So I think that we've done a better job. I think there were a lot of unanswered questions uh, there were a lot of places where people need guidance right. and that's stuff that we are continuing to work on and will always continue to work on but i think it's easier to find answers to questions about how to build on stellar now i think that we've done a better job of sort of documenting um the the projects that are on the ecosystem so if you're wondering who's building on stellar i think you can now go to the projects and partners page on stellar.org under ecosystem and have a better sense of who's doing what like actual legit projects that are using stellar i think that we've also and this is not just the ecosystem team, but just like in general, I think that we've done a better job of like starting to work to build uh, standards for building on top of Stellar, specifically Stellar ecosystem proposals, right? Like, so 
the, the, the way that you build an anchor on Stellar is that you not only integrate with Stellar, but you also create this outside infrastructure and the process for describing and documenting and, and coming up with a spec for building that so that, so that like different ecosystem participants can interoperate. We've improved that process a lot. And then finally, I think we've also really uh, increased uh, transparency. And I think you see this a lot of the time because we're, we're, we're bringing a lot more news to the fore. We're talking a lot about what SDF is doing. We're sort of clearly pointing to our mandate, which explains not just what our mission is, but like actually what our fund, like where our funds are and how, and how we're allocating them. And they're not our funds, where the lumens that we sort of steward are and how we're allocating them to grow the network but also down to like broadcasting the uh, the open protocol discussions or, or the, the ecosystem roundtables or even this podcast, right? Where we've done a much better job of telling the world what SDF is up to. Yeah, agreed. Tyler, you got anything? Yeah, just following up a little bit on that. I think it's a really unique situation that we're in where a lot of technologies or software are um, that's built, I, I would argue, particularly in the blockchain space, tend to be a bit isolated where they're trying to create an entire ecosystem within themselves. So the payments and the communication and the execution through product is all happening kind of in the same space. And so you're solving problems um, in a very unified way, in a very tight knit way, where with Stellar, um, uh, as an interoperable network, we're by our very nature connecting with external um, uh, points of contact. And so that, that becomes a real challenge where um, you're trying to bring cohesion and unity where very different people and very different goals are interacting, where our common ground may be payments and value transfers, but where that comes into play is going to be in completely different arenas. And I think that's something that's really exciting about being on the ecosystem team is getting to have those conversations and be in those meetings and communicate and think through how do we bring cohesion and transparency and um, some sort of sense of let's move this together, let's move this forward together, but in a way that's clear and not confused, but also flexible and actually useful because we don't have an isolated environment where our decisions only affect the few that are using this product or using this product in this very specific way. Um, our, our solutions and software is going to be used in a very wide range of uh, applications. And so trying to create some sort of cohesion and unity around that is a real challenge. Um, but it's a ton of fun to think about and work on because there is still that commonality of value transfer and payments. Um, and it's just how that's executed where things like SF, uh, the seller ecosystem proposal comes into play where you start to talk and discuss around, okay, how are we going to handle this specific aspect of um, application or use case in in the ecosystem um, so as the as the head of ecosystem as you're looking at um, enabling those on the team to kind of accomplish these goals and and think through and develop solutions or experiment with things how do you see your role now going from a single man ecosystem team just writing documentation to now being the head of, of an ecosystem team um, and delegating a lot of responsibilities but also providing guidance, I think, in a very fast moving um, environment. What has that been like going from writing docs to, to managing a team? And dealing with me and Tyler. Of course, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's been great. Like, I feel really fortunate to be working with everyone on the team. And I feel like it, everyone has great initiative and everyone has great ideas. And so I view my role a lot as support and coordination. Um, like, I think it's a highly collaborative team. And I'd say the organization as a whole is highly collaborative. And I'd say the ecosystem as a whole is highly collaborative. But specifically on this team, I just feel like it's uh, it's about trying to to help people make, like, make good decisions quickly and to help them refine their thinking, um, to help them be able to like sort of um, think through or do things in an effective way. And so a lot of that's just like support and helping. And then a lot of it also is just like, listening. I mean, from my perspective, everyone on this team is always coming up with great ideas. And so like listening to those ideas and thinking like, okay, how do we execute on that? How do we get that across the finish line? Or how do we choose between these two competing ideas? How do we, you know, just sort of like giving, helping give a framework that both allows ideas and allows um, choice and execution and some, you know, the creation of like some sort of standard or 
uh, for, for, for the kinds of communications that we make, like that's it. And then I, I think in many ways, it's like everyone has risen to, to the challenge, right? Like at some point, everyone has come up with an idea or been challenged to take on a task that is outside their comfort zone and everyone on the team is cool with that, right? So it's like, suddenly you are trying something that you've never tried before. And I feel like my goal is to help you take that leap. Yeah, and I think like branching off of that, um, I think we've done a good job, especially lately. And because of you, like not spending too much time just thinking about how it, how something can be done perfectly. Instead, we've just been kind of like trying it out and seeing what happens. Um, okay, Zoom, just let me know that they removed the time limit from our group meeting. Thank you, Zoom. Okay, anyways, moving on. Uh, but basically, we, we don't spend, like, you know, depending on the severity of the decision, right, we don't spend a ton of time just thinking about how we should do it. And instead, we just kind of, we kind of make it, we ship it, right? We make it go live. Like, this podcast is an example of that, the live broadcast, like the engineering talks, the the open protocol discussions, etc. What has kind of, like, driven that ideology in you to kind of have this mindset of, like, let's just let's just do it and see what happens. And then if if something goes wrong, right, we can fix it. Yeah, iterate. I mean, yeah. I think it's just the, the idea behind like agile software development. It's working right. with developers. That's how developers approach problems a lot of the time because if you get stuck trying to make something perfect, a lot of the times you spend effort on the wrong things. So it's better to create something, put it out there, see how people respond, figure out what you can do better, and then iterate, 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 iterate. One. Two, I think it's for content, it's a good way to generally like grow an audience if you're like reliable and reliably improving. You know, I think people are more likely to start to tune in. Um, so I think it comes from just like almost like a newspaper like perspective on content creation. And, uh, you know, it's it's also, and I guess this is the third reason, like I think that the best way to get better at something is by doing it. And so if you're just constantly working on one thing or thinking about one thing, you get stuck, you're also not really growing. So it's a, it's a way to grow fast. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I just to echo that a little bit, I think the thing that I've found most valuable in my own transition from uh, where I was to, to SDF is being able to have crazy ideas and not worry that I'm going to be allowed to do something that's off topic in a sense. So uh, your ability to, um, as, as the head of ecosystem or, or really as a manager, um, to sort of see the difference between um, an idea that's going to need an iteration, but is still on target with the mission versus a crazy idea that really has nothing to do with the mission or even a very achievable mission or achievable uh, idea that has nothing to do with the mission. And, and being able to say that these are different things and that uh, as the head of ecosystem, your role is very much to say, whatever we're working on, is it helping us achieve the mission? Even if it's not perfectly fleshed out or polished, it can be so long as the, the drive and purpose behind it is to align with the, the mission of the SDF and is good for Stellar. Um, and so in that sense, I'm free to sort of think crazy thoughts and have crazy ideas without the fear that I'm gonna be allowed to do something that's really a bad idea because ultimately it's not in line with the mission. And I also don't have to overly focus and write huge documents and spend a ton of time planning and thinking through all of the details of something so long as I can defend how this is in line with our vision and in line with uh, something that's helpful and beneficial to SDF um, or uh, Stellar. And that's, that's, that's allowed me a lot of freedom to build things and try things. And um, a lot of ideas may get shut down, but it's very clear why they get shut down or why we need to pivot away from those. Um, because ultimately it's not that it's not fully fleshed out. It's that it's not going to be an idea that benefits SDF or Stellar. And that's, that's what that's what ultimately you want out of management is somebody lets you do what you want so long as it aligns with a clear vision within whatever department you're a part of. Yeah, and I think we we're in an interesting position because we get like double the feedback, right? So internally we might think something's a great idea and then we put it out to the community or the ecosystem and they might be like, Oh my god, why did you guys do this? Or like, we don't like this, or maybe it should be done this way or whatever. So like I think we have this really cool, we're in this really cool spot just because we we have this sort of philosophy internally 
and we're able to see how that directly correlates to how the community feels as well. And so it allows us to like not only iterate really quickly internally and get things shipped, but it also allows us to adjust really quickly whenever those things actually go live. Tyler, do you have anything, uh, anything you want to I add? have no interruptions to add at this point. No interruptions. Um, I would, I would be curious. So sh I mean, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, um, our most recent protocol 13 push and the coordination around that and some of the communication improvements that we're trying to make there. Um, but before we get to that, maybe, maybe we can, uh, run off on one of our tangents a bit and just talk a bit about cryptocurrency in general, some of the adoption stuff. I know you've worked closely. You wrote a lot of the documentation for anchors and anchor adoption and how to run an anchor. Um, so maybe just talk a bit about anchors, where you see anchors going, what role they play um, in the ecosystem, and some monetization numbers. Just kind of wax eloquent for a moment um, sure. about one of our most. Should key we first say what that ecosystem. is? Like what? Yeah, exactly. What is an Define anchor? It. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, I, I want to say that the documentation that you're referring to is something that people should check out. It's on developers.stellar.org under the enable deposit and withdrawal section, and I will say, like, I helped with that content, but a lot of it also was a collaboration with the integration team, um, which is pretty typical. You know, there's a lot of collaboration across teams that happens here. So a lot of that content was really originated with Victor on, on the integration team um, and Anchor. Well, there's actually a lot of talk about the term Anchor and about what stellar anchors are and about whether, you know, how we sort of conceive of them and how they might work. And there's actually a, a webinar coming up I, I don't remember the exact date, but if you check stellar.org slash events, it'll be there. That is all about the, the sort of what an anchor is, what the business case is, um, why you should run one. So you should check that out if you want to know more about anchors. My short version, um, Stellar is a network that lets you tokenize, uh, create a digital asset. And one of the most useful digital assets that you can create is a representation of a real world currency. So a digital US dollar, a digital Brazilian real, a digital Chinese yuan. Um, the services that basically allow you to tokenize uh, real world fiat currencies and it, it, it basically convert them into stellar network tokens are what we call anchors. They're the on off ramps for the stellar network. Basically, if I have dollars, I can deposit them with an anchor service. For instance, Anchor USD. I put a hundred, I send a hundred dollars to their bank account. They issue me a hundred uh, USD tokens on the Stellar network. And at any given point, I could do whatever I want with those dollars on the network. I can transfer them, trade them. Um, at any point, I can also withdraw them or any USD, Anchor USD tokens that I hold by returning them on network back to Anchor USD. And they will then basically credit my bank account with whatever, you know, the, the tokens that I return. So it's, it's basically an on off ramp for the network. Um, usually they're tied to a specific fiat currency. So Let's get to that. Like anchors in sort of the stellar vernacular tend to be organizations in a specific uh, location, um, specific jurisdiction that deal with a specific currency or set of current currencies. So these are organizations that are compliant with local regulations that connect to existing banking rails and that integrate with stellar to, to, to be the on off ramp. In the sort of worldwide picture of the ecosystem of stellar, there's this idea that, you know, hey, let's just say all the world's currencies. Imagine that we could get an anchor for every currency in the world. Suddenly, wherever you are, you'd be able to give cash or via sort of local banking rails, give money to an anchor service, and they would be able to create value on the network that represented that deposit in that local currency. And in the ideal world, there would be great liquidity between all those different assets on the network. So, and you would be able to easily transmute or convert any currency to any other currency. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the idea of anchors and the, this this dream of a world uh, of, of a fully populated stellar network where you can access the world's currencies from any given local on ramp. Yeah, and I, I guess you know branching off of that, I, the the precursor to why something like that needs to exist is because the current banking system uh, is a little bit fragmented, right? Like um, there's it's ba it's built on trust, but the thing is that trust doesn't scale very well. Whereas the Stellar network allows for trust between parties that don't actually know each other. So you have this way of coming to an agreement on the state of a balance sheet or 
you know, the network, really the state of the network, you have a way to come to agreement on that without needing to directly trust each other. So your friend group gets larger without actually needing to know who, who those friends are. Right. That, that makes it, that's totally right. And I think that also it solves a lot of inefficiencies that are inherent to the way that current banking works, especially when you start to deal with cross-border currencies yeah. or sort of more exotic currencies. Like it's pretty easy to, if you live in the United States to, to transfer US dollars around to your friends and who are in the same jurisdiction. But once you start crossing borders, crossing jurisdictions and crossing currencies, the inefficiencies of the, of the correspondent banking system where basically banks have to deal with all of these intermediary banks um, become really laid bare. And you know, it's, it's got issues with speed and with transparency and with cost. Um, it's, just, it's just a difficult thing to deal with. So yeah, once, once you're, you're sort of, everything's on the network and you're sort of, your friend group grows and the number of people that you can interact with and, and you can sort of interact using your currency of choice with any other currency of choice, all of a sudden, all of these payments, they're really difficult to do now, specifically cross-border payments, come pretty frictionless. And an analogy that we've used in the past that I think is very helpful, but often kind of blew over my head, um, is is email because if we're talking about just like payments it, it may be uh not immediately obvious why uh, being able to pay anyone in the world um is is valuable but that's ultimately because we don't do that we can't do that and so we operate in a world where that's not something we do but what if email was that way and it was really hard to send someone an email if they were in australia or china what if, what if that was difficult we don't it, it's completely outside of like our, our realm of thinking to think that that could even be possible. Like it's the internet, it's just all connected. Well, money is that way right now where it, you can't do it and it's very difficult and the rails aren't built and it's not magic, it's technology. And until that technology exists and these things have been connected, um, email would be in the same spot where you have physical mail where it has to go on a boat and travel and the internet allowed for that interoperability of communication. And with Stellar, you get that same interoperability just with value transfer, not just content or uh, textual transfer. Um, and that's that's a really powerful analogy I think is helpful um, because it's not just individual payments, it's business transfers. It's also not just fiat currencies. It's anything that you can, um, anything that has value that you can turn into a digital asset, whether that's real estate or art and other assets, um, ETFs and bonds. Uh, there's lots and lots of different assets um, that are being tokenized on Stellar. And once those are connected into a Stellar network, anywhere that those networks are being tapped into, immediately you have access to those, um, those networks. And that's incredibly powerful and something that we often take for granted in other arenas like email that I think we need to start assuming that should be the way it should work in payments and value transfer as well. And the reason yeah. that ultimately Stellar exists. Yeah, and you can take that that email example even further and say like, what if Gmail users could only send email to other Gmail users? Like imagine needing to have like seven different email accounts to communicate with like your different friends who are using all these different email accounts. And that's kind of how uh, the mm -hmm. current payment infrastructure is set up, right? Like you can't send money from Venmo to Cash App. I can't go from uh, Venmo to Robinhood or something like this. They Everybody kind of creates their walled gardens. And maybe at the very base layer, it's somewhat interconnected but it's still very fragmented and then once you like try to scale that up globally it just gets it gets even worse and more costly yeah and these i mean that's just the the nature of the free market is these things tend towards greater efficiencies where even with mail like yeah you could get a letter from point a to point b it would just take time and money to accomplish that and of course, whenever there's that friction, there's an opportunity for somebody to jump in and say, I want to decrease that friction. Um, and here we, we see the same opportunity where there's a high level of time and money being uh, involved in transferring these things. And so we see an opportunity to, to decrease that friction through, through Stellar. Um, but ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. And an anchor plays a critical role in providing that functionality because they allow for these um, these points of contact, your mailbox, if you will, um, for you to put in your money and for it to then um, be transferable instantly for a very low cost all over the world. Any other thoughts to add to that, Justin? <laughs> no, I think that's great. Cool. Um, I guess we can, we can start to move on to uh, protocol 13 because this is 
I would say this is definitely one of the bigger uh, upgrades we've had in a while, just as far as um, the coordination going into it and the amount of technical upgrades that are being included that are extremely beneficial. Um, so Justin, if you want to give like a quick summary of you know some of the stuff that's going into Protocol 13, that'd be sweet. Sure. Uh, there are three main new features to Protocol 13. Uh, the first is called fee bump transactions. The second is um, a new kind of asset authorization authorized to maintain liabilities. And the third is um, something called multiplex accounts. So uh, fee bumps, what are they? Basically, a fee bump is a kind of transaction that allows you to put a wrapper around another transaction and increase the fee. So this allows you, this has two advantages. One is that an app um, or an asset issuer can basically pay for their user's fees um, because their user can submit a transaction and they, the app can then wrap it in a fee and submit it to the network. Um, and they can do it in a way that, uh, a la that is like, um, if you try to do that in the past, there's some, and we don't have to get into the weeds, but there's some, there's some difficulties with um, sequence number management particularly, um, and also with uh, basically setting things up so that users can't, scammers can't collect those fees uh, for, for bad reasons, right? They can't, they can't uh, so fee bumps, um, what fee bumps allow in addition to that is that at some point given network activity, validators, uh, so I wanna say fees on the, on the Stellar network, the minimum network fee is determined by a validator vote. So it is a, like, um, like a lot of governance in Stellar, the people who decide exactly where it's set are the people who run validators that participate in consensus on the network. The minimum network fee right now is 100 Stroops, which is one times 10 to the negative seventh uh, lumen. So there's a really, really yeah. small number. Um, and that's good because transactions are cheap, but they might be too cheap, right? At some point, um, basically, you can use the Stellar network for things that are essentially spam, um, or you can use it to try to store data in a way that's like really inefficient. You should really be there are better places to store data and spam is bad for everybody. So if the network minimum is too low, it's too easy to use the network for reasons that don't, that aren't actually like native or inherent or uh, germane to the use of the network. So at some point, validators might wanna to choose to raise the middle network fee. Now, here's where fee bumps come in. Right now, or before protocol 13, if they wanted to raise the minimum network fee, they could potentially break any pre-signed transactions. So. What's a pre-signed transaction? In addition to making a transaction right now that I submit to the Stellar network, I could also instead create a transaction, basically create the XDR that encodes the transaction, get signatures from people and hold on to it until I'm ready to submit it. So let's say that there was some sort of escrow account, right? I buy a house, um, I pre-sign a transaction and the seller does and an escrow agent does. And on the day that the actual sale closes, that transaction can be submitted to the network. Well, if, between the time when I signed the transaction and the time it gets submitted, the minimum fee was of the net on the network was increased. The, 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 the fee for a transaction is encoded for pre-protocol 13 in the transaction itself. So when you try to submit that transaction, the network wouldn't accept it. And so this transaction that you had signed based on some agreement that you had would be invalid and you can't necessarily resubmit it. The signer might say, the other signers might not be willing to sign it or they might've lost their key that there, there's a lot of different situations where you don't want that to happen. So the network wants to make sure that people can submit pre-signed transactions. It's important to the to people trusting and using Stellar moving forward. So fee bumps basically in that situation, you could take that transaction and increase the fee, say, okay, the network minimum has increased. Now I'll keep that same transaction, but wrap a new um, a fee bump around it. And I can basically get it over the network minimum threshold. So fee bumps allow you basically to increase minimum fees, which might be necessary to prevent spam while not breaking pre-signed transactions, as well as allowing apps and services to cover user fees. So that's fee bumps. Should I keep going about the second thing? Yeah, that, well, I mean, you pretty much covered everything. And, and to me, like, for me, the most interesting part is being able to, to pay users fees because ultimately like the, the concept of fees, especially those paid in Lumens, for example, are extremely, uh, clunky for some it's it's a weird experience especially like uh, can, especially if you're not used to, to something like that whereas like on Venmo for example you you don't really pay fees like this like every transaction you don't have to deal with some fee that's in some currency that maybe you're not familiar with yeah. um, 
Whereas on Stellar, that is a little bit of a problem. So being able to facilitate the payment of fees on your user's behalf is extremely good for, I guess, like frictionless adoption, right? Because you can abstract away that complexity and they don't have to deal with it. Yeah, you can make an app that people don't know anything about stuff. They're using it yeah. to send to, to send dollars in Argentinian pesos, but they don't know anything about Stellar, right? Yeah. They don't even know that they're paying a fee in Lumens. They don't even know what a Lumen is. Right. So, like in terms of building apps that actually hit the real world and solve real world problems, that th that's huge. You can't really imagine that you're going to scale an app when the beginning of the app goes like this. Okay, first, let me teach you about cryptocurrency. Yeah. It's like no. No. Yeah, please don't like, do that. I don't want to know about cryptocurrency. Please don't. Right? You just want people to be yeah. able to pick it up and right. use it. So if you can conceal lumens and network feeds and stuff like that by covering, by covering them on behalf of your users, aces. You're like part of the way there towards you know you still have to build a killer app right or just like a great interface or get users on it, but it helps. It removes an impediment to user adoption. It's yeah, and, and I mean like we can go back to when sort of peer-to-peer -peer payment apps were really starting to launch. Like you can go back to the early days of PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, et cetera. Like they, we already had to go through this onboarding process of trusting these companies with your money to make these payments. I remember I remember specifically when Venmo came out, I think I was still in high school and it people thought it was the sketchiest thing ever created. And so they had to go through this really long process of like getting people to trust that uh, that type of financial interaction. And so like, why would we want to have to do that again for a new type of application whenever they're already used to something else? It doesn't feel it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like it makes sense. And it feels like it kind of pushes us back. And so if we can come up with mechanisms to remove the need to do all of that onboarding and kind of push the, the burden of onboarding to the business, I feel like that's a lot more comfortable for, especially for the entity trying to build some application because then they don't have to worry about they don't have to worry about onboarding themselves and then they don't have to worry about onboarding the users. Yeah. Cool. I think. Yeah. We can... So that's fee bumps. Yeah. I, well, I mean, I guess the one thing that I would like to say is that a lot of people might not remember or might not know how fees actually work on the stellar network. Um, with the stellar network, you actually submit the highest fee you're willing to pay, but you're charged the lowest possible fee to get on the ledger. So. Which is not the way Ethereum works. If I, pay, I want to pay. I'm willing to pay a hundred thousand stroops. Right. Right. We'll get to that. Like, it's like I want to pay a hundred thousand stroops maximum for this transaction, which is 0.1 lumen. Right. Then I wouldn't necessarily be charged. I'm not, I, that fee is not what I'm actually charged necessarily. I could be charged that as the maximum amount, but if uh, ledger activity is light and the ledger is not full, I'll actually be charged the network minimum. So I say willing to pay a hundred thousand network activity is light. I just get charged a hundred. The cool thing about that is that that means that you can't really bone yourself by accidentally <laughs> choosing a super high fee and like you won't get charged that fee. So there's a lot, there are in the fee structure of Stellar, there's already a certain amount of user protection, um, but still, right, uh, you don't want users to be thinking about fees. Yeah. And you don't want to accidentally pay a $2 million fee. No accidentally but never mind we'll move on uh ne next uh <laughs> next what was, what was the next thing oh oh uh on your list it's um a new kind of asset authorization yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. so on stellar there's there's always been uh asset uh flags for that, that you put at the account level for assets um basically you can decide you can either create an asset that has no flags it's author it's it's uh, anyone can sort of buy or sell or hold that asset but you can also put an auth required flag on an asset. And that means that in order to hold an asset, right, a, a Stellar account, you have the issuer has to authorize the Stellar account to, to use it. Now, this is really important when it comes to like regulated assets. So if, for instance, we're talking about some kind of investment um, that requires someone to be an accredited investor, for instance, uh, the asset issuer can't just give it to anyone. They have to check the credentials of the investor and say, I authorize you to hold this asset. And then they basically, uh, they, they create the asset with the asset authorization in place. And then when they authorize someone to hold it, uh, they basically run, run some code that says this, that authorize the trust line for the account holder to hold that auth required asset. Now the problem or the new kind of asset flag, well, sorry, that's an auth required asset. There's also a second type of authorization called auth revocable, which basically says, um, I can authorize someone to hold this asset and then deauthorize them to hold this asset. Um, 
And this new, but when you, in, in the old author revocable world, when you deauthorize someone to hold an asset, you also cancel all their orders on the books. So essentially, that would mean that if I sold you, if, I, if you were an accredited investor in this same example, and you got this investment token, um, and I then deauthorized your trust line so that you couldn't get more without checking with me, any buy and sell offers uh, that you had on the books would also get canceled. And that's problematic because you actually want, there's, there's situations with regulated assets where you want off, uh, certain account holders to be authorized to still continue to buy and sell that asset. So there's this new middle ground um, authorization that basically makes it so that an, uh, an issuer can uh, revoke someone's ability to continue to, to use an asset temporarily but still maintain their, the, the sell orders on, on the book. Um, so what this means is that now as an issuer of a regulated asset, I can create a transaction that has three operations. I basically create an asset that is set to authorization required and um, no, one's, no one's like basically, uh, an account holder is not allowed to, it's not authorized to use this asset. But if that uh, issuer then wants to make a new buy offer or transfer that asset, I can create a sandwich operation with a transaction with three operations. First, I authorize the user to uh, to transact with the asset again. Then I allow the, then the, then the user submits the operation. Um, and then I deauthorize the user. So basically like I, as the issuer, end up approving every single transaction while still allowing the sell orders that that person have, has to stay on the books reason why this is important is that this is something that issuers of regulator, regulated assets need in order to issue STOs, security tokens, and things like that on Stellar. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, ultimately, it just makes the protocol more flexible for facilitating like nuanced financial transactions, which um, Stellar has gotten increasingly better at over time as like more features have been implemented and more steps have been implemented and stuff. But like, as you kind of look into the weird world of, of finance like you realize things are actually really weird and like there's a lot of, of nuance into how interactions take place it's not as cut and dry as like i send you this you can now do this for forever there are weird situations like what you kind of just described so being able to facilitate those just makes assets on seller more more flexible i mean that's kind of like the the short version of what's going on here and i imagine like in the future, as people maybe adapt Stellar to certain use cases, like it might be the case that other stuff gets added, like it could totally be possible. But you made a good point toward the end of that, like that's what people are, are asking for. And there's been real demand for that type of functionality. So being able to implement it is really important. Yeah, these yeah, auth required flags are definitely part of how companies can um, sort of issue tokens on Stellar and still comply with local jurisdictional requirements, right? right. Um, so they can, it's like, we need, the, the idea was to build a model that allowed compliance, but still allowed them to do the thing that they need to do. You know, how issuers actually use this, that they'll, they'll be obviously working with financial regulations and sort of executing this, these, these flags based on what they need to do in, in, in their given jurisdiction. Tyler, I saw you were about to say something. Yeah, and I think it's just really interesting and, and fantastic that Stellar is not a static protocol like we're constantly evolving based on feedback that upgrade process is is relatively rapid and very iterative it's it's a community project this is a this is a global uh, open source um, network that's constantly evolving and building out new features as the demand requires it and that's it's really important that when you look at stellar if you have a payment uh, use case, and Stellar doesn't meet that use case, there may be precedent for coming in and saying, would you, does it make sense to change the protocol in this way to support it? Rather than just saying, well, unfortunately we can't do what we want. Um, that you can come to Stellar with a payment use case and say, even if it's not natively supported yet, perhaps it could be. And be, be willing to join into a conversation through all of our different channels to explore that possibility. And then voila, you get protocol 13 and features that simply weren't possible are now native to the ecosystem, to the protocol. That's amazing. Uh, so yeah, cover, um, let's talk about the Mux accounts real quick and then talk a little bit about the, the 
process for communicating these these releases, sure. and then we'll wrap up. Um, Mux accounts, Mux accounts, multiplexed accounts. Um, a lot of exchanges, for instance, um, but other other sort of custodial services that have a bunch of users and keep them in an internal database. Instead of having giving each user their own Stellar account, they'll use a single Stellar account. And basically, when funds go in or out of that account, they'll map it internally to their users uh, on, on there and to the sort of user database on there. Um, in the past, people have done this using the memo field. So you would send to, say, Coinbase's key, uh, Stellar key with a memo that would identify the account number that you actually want the payment to be credited to. Um, and this led to a lot of problems. People forgot their memos all the time. Um, so in order to prevent people from forgetting their memos, uh, we actually, there was a, a sort of stellar ecosystem proposal solution that came out recently. I think it was SEP 29 that solved that problem. Um, but in order for it to ex like basically be enacted, first people had to uh, flag their accounts to be memo required. Um, and that was pretty good. It actually did solve that one particular part of the problem. But at the same time, while thinking about how to solve that problem on an ecosystem level, um, it became clear that there was also a solution on a protocol level, right? Something that we could build into the Stellar protocol itself that would solve that problem and would actually solve it better. So what it is, it basically creates a new kind of account um, on Stellar, uh, a MUX account or multiplex account that has built into the account, the public address, um, a, uh, a, a, a memo, you know? Um, so when you send to that account, it can properly on the other end, like sort of, uh, direct the payment to the internal user account that, that, that it needs to be directed to. Um, the advantage of doing it at the protocol level is that uh, not only does it solve that problem, but it also starts to allow you to actually, uh, memos only attach to the uh, transaction level. So you can put a, a transaction, uh, you can put a memo on a transaction, but you can't put it on an operation. On Stellar, a transaction is just a bundle of operations. You submit transactions to the network and a transaction is defined as anywhere from one to 100 operations. But it's a, more efficient for organizations that are doing a bunch to like batch operations into a transaction. And so it's, instead of submitting a single transaction for every outgoing payment, for instance, they can now batch operations and submit you know, 100 operations in one transaction. And each of those operations can go, can like attach the memo at the operation level. So it's more efficient that way. But also with Mux accounts, you can now see, uh, you can you used to be able to sort of track the, the, the sending side, but you couldn't, uh, the receiving side. So I could say, I'm sending to this account with a memo attached, then you know who it should go to on that side. But if I'm sending from a multiplex account, there's no indication which user who's, who has like sort of an account that is a sub account of that, where the payment is coming from. And with these new multiplex accounts, you'll be able to tell the, origin as well as the destination of the payment. Um, and so that means that you can do things like return payments or you know, verify that a given user actually paid you uh, who uses a, a custodial service like an exchange. Um, multiplex accounts are now part of the protocol, but it's kind of like we did the, the wiring, but we didn't put in any switches. And by that, I mean, how you use them, we still have to figure out. And so that means that like the Horizon team and the people who work on SDKs have to figure out a way to manifest this new change to the protocol so that users can actually easily access it and use it. So they're there. Um, and at some point soon, we'll come up with some like developer ergonomic way to actually start using them. But for now, they're just kind of like a hidden secret feature. Yeah. And I think another, you know, circling back to the point made earlier, like this is just another a uh, feature that helps take some of the stress off of the actual user, right? Like so a lot of the problem with the current memo model is like uh, for most other uh, different blockchain projects, like requiring a memo for a deposit to a custodial account is not necessary, uh, whether that's like Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever. Uh, but on Stellar it is. So a lot of the time people just literally skip over the window that says, make sure you put this memo in there. And we, I mean, we still see these questions like every single week, like what do I do if I forgot my memo, blah, blah, blah. So introducing something at the protocol level that allows for these custodial solutions, which are obviously desired by the market, to be able to take burden off of their off of their users is a, a really big deal. I think it just highlights such an interesting uh, aspect of development, which is like you really need to make sure you understand your users 
because literally all we're doing is taking two inputs and making it one. But that's significant enough of a challenge that it's worth changing the entire protocol to support. And, and we think asking users to do, you know, 24 word monomic phrases and capture all their secret keys and make sure like that that's okay, that they'll be able, they should understand, they should just get it. And yet people are literally forgetting to take two, take two strings and put those both in. Um, it's, it's difficult. It's a, it's a hard world out there when you're trying to kind of manage a lot of your own stuff. And we need to remember who our users are and build for actual use case and not remove ourselves from the requests that we're making and uh, ensuring that they're not overly complex. Right. Everybody so, has their own problems. They don't want to have to deal with the memo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it's so funny because like one of the first things when I joined SCF, like that was the first thing I realized was like a huge problem. I think the first blog post I ever wrote when I when I got here was what happens? What do I do if I forgot my memo? And I kind of like broke down all of this stuff. And I mean, because the, the gut feeling you get whenever, I mean, this is kind of native to the entire space, that, that feeling when you send a, a transaction to, for the first time to a public key and you press send and you're like, oh my God, like if I mess this up, these are gone. Hmm. And then there's a situation where you know you copied your public key right, but you forgot the memo and you still get that feeling. You know, you felt like you did everything right and then you still messed up somehow. And those funds ultimately aren't like, literally lost forever like a lot of the time the exchange can actually help you recover those it's just, it's just a really tedious process right because you're dealing with a ton of these requests but if you can remove that feeling of i thought i did everything right and i still messed up that everybody's kind of better off and, and you don't like scare people away as easily well yeah and i mean it's a clunky experience you know when you're trying to deal with a place that requires memos like you it's never a great sign or a great user experience when you have to go through a screen that says important warning, make sure yeah. you do this or you will, you know, and you're just like, wow, that would, that scares a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I never want to do that again. <laughs> yeah. So I guess moving past like the technical side of, of protocol 13, what this one has been, it's felt a little different on the rollout just because there's so many breaking changes. So kind of talk about that. Like what has that process been like one for you and then, for the team as a whole, like what are some of the steps that we've tried to take and maybe what are some of the different approaches we've taken this time for this particular upgrade? Yeah, I mean, I won't even, you know, a protocol upgrade, there's all of these different steps. Basically it's a, it's a change to Stellar Core and everything downstream from Stellar Core tends to have to change. And in this case, the actual shape of the XDR that Stellar Core uses changed, right? So I guess, hang on, I actually have this. So it's like, if this is sort of like the shape of a, of the XDR that Stellar nice. Core is passing around, right? And uh, like what happened with this protocol change, right? Is that we added, um, let's let's say we added uh, Mux accounts, right? For instance, and then we added a fee bump wrapper. This is amazing. This is going better than expected. <laughs> we added a fee bump wrapper, and so now like the shape of the sort of data structure of Stellar Core looks like this. Right. And that's all fine and well, except for the fact that, like, if you have a system that's expecting this to plug into this and suddenly it's thrown that, it, it will break it, right? right? So you have to make sure that whatever system is downstream from the new shape, from the new, basically from the new XDR, is prepared to receive it. And so that means you have to change Stellar, I mean, Horizon, the Stellar API, and you have to change all the SDKs. And then anyone who has an app built on Stellar that uses Stellar Core or Horizon or the SDKs, has to make sure that they have a version of all of those things that is ready for these new changes. Um, otherwise, you know, the, the brain will get scrambled of whatever it is that they're using. And so the challenge, so first of all, I want to say the biggest challenge, in a lot of ways, the biggest challenge is an engineering one, right? So it's difficult to put these changes into Stellar Core in a way that's very safe and logical. But once you do that, it's a huge challenge for the Horizon team to then figure out how to adapt Horizon um, in order to accept the changes that are in Stellar Core. And then it's a huge problem for the SDK developers to understand how to change their SDKs to, to, to the modified version of Horizon. So along each step, there's an engineering challenge. And the people who work on those are like amazing. They, and I think on protocol 13, despite the fact that it was like a really difficult one to, to think about, to engineer, they did a great job. On the communication side, the challenge becomes 
Stellar is decentralized, self-serve, permissionless. Anyone can be using it, and we don't necessarily know who's using it, right? We have some sense maybe of who's running nodes because they, as part of their communication to be on the network, they, they, they pass which version number they use. But we don't know who's running Horizon or what version they're running. We don't know who's using what SDK and what version of an SDK they're using. So it becomes this problem of, we don't know who's out there and we don't know what they're using. But we need to get the message across to every single one of them that they need to upgrade their software by a certain date or it's gonna break, every, or their, their service is gonna break. And so how do you do that, right? Well, you know, the, the, a lot of what we learned this time, I think we sort of started out by trying to communicate what was happening, what the plan was, trying to keep track of all the moving parts, um, you know, having a guide basically that we kept up to date and always pointing to this one guide. So at any given point, you could check that guide and if the SDK that you used is fine, it supports protocol 13, it has been released, you can find the link there. So like we start with the guide, we message all of our channels. Um, and then I think what we learned this time was that in addition to doing that, because that's a really good way to hit the real like Stellar community, but there are a lot of people who are not necessarily subscribed to Stellar channels and Stellar is part of what they do, but they're not like thinking about it every day, but it, it is important that their stuff doesn't break. So for example, exchange like uh, crypto exchanges, right? They deal with a lot of different blockchains, but we don't want their Lumen integration or like their Stellar integration to break either. So it, it becomes clear that in addition to doing that, we also, we also do bespoke outreach, right? So we have to email all these people. Um, I think the thing that we learned this time was that before scheduling any kind of protocol upgrade, what we need to do is poll a lot of people in the Stellar uh, ecosystem, the broader Stellar ecosystem, and say, hey, are you going to be ready? I need, I, I want to know. Because at the beginning, I was just, we were just saying, make sure to be ready. Here's what you need to do. And then it was like, who's ready? Um, oh, we should know. So that's one thing that we learned. It's probably pretty obvious. but. Now I think it's going to be inform people and then check to see if they're ready and try to get as many thumbs up we're ready as possible before actually committing to a date for the protocol change. Yeah, and part of that is creating like our own internal mapping of the be the best we can understand the seller ecosystem, right? Like I, a lot, some of you who are listening to this probably have received a message from me over the past week or two, like asking what you're using, like what does your tech stack look like? because we're trying to see who's using what. So we understand, you know, whenever an SDK says they're ready or they're not ready, who is that directly affecting? And then how do we make sure that there's some coordination there that we could understand that, okay, if this SDK is not ready, here's everything that will break. If this were to, to be pushed forward or if this was to be um, uh, sped up or something like this. So like coming up with our own internal mapping has, is going to be like its own, its own challenge, but I think it'll be super helpful. So if you are listening to this and I haven't reached out to you, please reach out to me or Justin or Tyler, anybody, and let us know what you're using so that we can make better decisions about how we roll out these type of upgrades. Cause there are consequences, especially for upgrades where things get broken. We don't want your service to break, obviously. So like, like we want to make sure that we have the best system in place to, to avoid problems like that. And some of it's directly reaching out, but another part of it is like, don't hesitate to reach out to us too. Like we want to know what your tech stack is. It might sound boring, but we want to know because we don't want to break it. And the more we understand that, the better decisions we can make. Yeah, I think we'll just get better at these protocol upgrades as, as they continue to happen. But anyone out there who can help us, like by letting us know, as Colton mentioned, like anything that you can, about how you're using Stellar. It will not only help us with these protocol upgrades, but as I mentioned, like, you know, yours, pe people who build on Stellar tend to be, like the apps built on Stellar are downstream even from SDK. So Stellar Core, Horizon, SDKs, apps. Um, but in a lot of ways, we also wanna pass information from all the way from what happens to apps, what their experience is like with an upgrade, all the way back to the developers at Stellar Core and Horizon and the SDKs so that we can help everyone understand how to do a better job, what the pain points are, um, how to improve the, the, the sort of software that they're building. And, you know, this is open source. We're here. We, you can contribute. You can communicate with us. Um, your feedback is definitely a big part of what drives decisions and discussion. And, and we're hoping to just keep doing a better job getting it from you, your feedback. Yeah, feedback is the main part because we often agree with each other around here. So if somebody could tell us we're wrong, I'm I'm open to I'm open yeah. to that. 
And on that note. Yeah, I think we're at the hour mark. So, I mean, we could, I mean, we could talk for the next like eight, uh, we could talk for another nine hours until midnight if we wanted to, but maybe we won't. So maybe next time. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe next time. time we'll do a 12 hour marathon or something. Uh, but yeah, thanks everybody uh, for tuning in. And Justin, you, thanks so much. Yeah. Justin, for, uh, thanks for coming. Popping in. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was really nice. Fun. I liked it. Yeah. And, for sure. uh, yeah, let's do it again sometime. Yeah, of course. And for those of you who want to watch or listen to, actually, if you want to watch this episode, you got to head over to uh, the YouTube channel because you have to see Justin's amazing Lego example. You won't be able to experience this if, if you're listening to the audio. Uh, but also, like, if you're interested in previous episodes, you could check out the YouTube channel or you could check out podcast.stellar.org for all the audio versions um, to keep up with everything Stellar, of course, the Stellar Twitter account, which is at Stellar.org. If you want to get in contact with me or Tyler or Justin, please go into the key base and ask us questions or let us let us know your feedback, not only on the show, but on, on anything we're doing in the ecosystem. Like we're here to serve the ecosystem. So any feedback, of course, is valuable. Um, Tyler, do you have anything to add before we close it out? Nope, that's fantastic. Awesome. Thanks everyone for tuning in. It's been a good a good episode and we'll uh, we'll catch you again next week. Yep, yep. Thanks, everybody.